Good evening and welcome. I'm Donna McPhee. I graduated from Columbia College in 1989, and I'm the Vice President for Alumni Relations and President of the Columbia Alumni Association. And I'm pleased to be here to welcome you on behalf of the CAA and the university. Before we get started with the program, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to talk about the CAA and the Columbia alumni community. We have almost 300,000 alumni worldwide, and the CAA is connecting all of you through the school-specific programs and through university-wide initiatives. The energy and enthusiasm from the alumni community is happening on campus in New York City and all over the world. Alumni are connecting through events and programs like this, through Facebook, through LinkedIn, through email, and so much more. Some of our fall highlights include our CAA Assembly Weekend Alumni Panel. It occurred in New York City, was moderated by President Bollinger, and featured prominent alumni. The topic this year was Unlocking Creativity, and some of the alumni included Brian Dennehy and Tom Kitt, who recently won the Tony and the Pulitzer Prize for the Broadway show Next to Normal. We also had pre-game festivities at homecoming this fall, and over 1,500 alumni and their families participated in activities under a big tent. We had carnival games, and it was really just a joyous celebratory event for the alumni. We are busy planning for this coming weekend's CAA event in Miami. It's in conjunction with the Art Basel Pro Contemporary Art Fair. We're planning for Sundance in Park City, Utah, and we've received the inside scoop that some of our alumni have been selected to showcase their films at the festival in January. We have over 80 regional programs around the world, and alumni are connecting with the help of alumni leaders, like several who are here tonight. We recently had the worldwide networking event. It occurred in 70 cities around the world, and over 2,700 alumni participated. We're looking forward to the spring, to connecting alumni once again through the Columbia Community Outreach Program that not only connects alumni with each other, but connects back with the students on campus who will be participating in projects in New York City. We also have our reunions. That's the opportunity for you to come back to campus. So when it's your time to celebrate your reunion year, please come back to campus. And while you're participating in the activities, visit us in the Columbia Alumni Center. It is your home on campus. It opened almost two years ago. And it features a library, a lounge, come grab a cup of coffee, speak with fellow Columbi Columbians, see Columbiana in our library, and there's staff there to help you to navigate the campus. Alumni are not only connecting with each other, they're connecting back with the university. And we're so happy to say that they are, alumni are so enthusiastic that Almost 90,000 alumni have participated in our Columbia campaign and have donated. We are almost at the goal of $4 billion a year ahead of schedule. We're very thankful for all you do, for staying connected, and we can urge you to continue to be part of our vibrant alumni community. I would like to point out a senior administrator from New York City who's with us tonight, Fred Van Sickle. On January 1, he will be the new Executive Vice President for University Development and Alumni Relations. Welcome, Fred. Now I would like to introduce another alum, Ben Harwitz, a Northern Californian, a true Columbian, and a fixture in Silicon Valley. A Berkeley High School graduate, Ben graduated in 1988 <laughs> ben graduated in 1988 from Columbia College with a major in computer science. Following a master's in computer science at UCLA, he began his career at Lotus Development Corporation before moving on to senior positions at Netscape, followed by co-founding Opsware in 1999. He further served as the head of business technology optimization unit at Hewlett Packard. In 2009, together with colleague Mark Anderson, Ben founded the venture firm Anderson Horowitz, which has recently received prominent mention in the New York Times, among other publications. 
publications. Ben's father, David, is a class of 1959 college graduate. Ben and his wife, Felicia, have three daughters, Mariah, Sophia, and Julia, who is a senior at the college majoring in Spanish and linguistics. Please welcome Ben Horowitz. All right, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, I am here to introduce uh, Lee Bollinger and Bill Campbell, uh, two friends of mine and two people who I'm uh, very proud and privileged to have the honor of introducing. Um, <clears throat> Lee, a graduate, a graduate of Columbia Law School, is the president of Columbia University and one of the nation's most thoughtful and original scholars of the First Amendment. He has received numerous awards and honors for his writings and public uh, actions defending freedom of speech and press. He is also well known for his leadership in successfully defending affirmative action and diversity in American higher education, which the United States Supreme Court upheld in 2003. His books include The Tolerant Society, Freedom of Speech, and Extremist Speech in America, Images of a Free Press, and Externally Vigilant Free Speech in the Modern Era. Um, and I'd like to add that, you know, from my perspective in, in uh, observing presidents of Columbia since I was a student, um, the thing that Lee brings to the university that is um, so different and so incredible uh, is leadership across a broad variety of issues. Um, and, you know, you could see it at University of Michigan where he was president and uh, he led the nation to uh, coming to the right outcome on affirmative action. Uh, but then at Columbia, be it the, uh, the capital campaign, which is the, the, the largest and most ambitious in the university's history, or making the university uh, truly global, um, these kinds of initiatives are just things that, you, you know, that we've grown accustomed to but are, are quite remarkable and uh, just great to have him here as a president. Uh, Bill Campbell. Um, graduated from Columbia with a BA in economics and uh, also a master's in teaching. Um, he was the football coach at Columbia for six years um, before going into the business world. Uh, and his players will say he was a very good coach. Uh, his record says a pretty good coach. <laughs> <laughs> He went on, uh, you know, and he was, Bill, remarkable thing about Bill is he was, uh, you know, he was in his late 30s when he moved from coaching into business, um, but had a stunningly successful business career, um, starting as an executive at Kodak uh, and then at Apple, um, and moving on to become the chief executive officer of a company called Go, um, which was basically building the iPhone in 1992. Um, which was too early, by the way. <laughs> and in technology being too early is n not good. Uh, but he, you know, despite the fact that he was way too early, uh, people recognized his leadership skills, and he uh, became CEO of Intuit, uh, which he built um, from 1994 to 1998 into one of the most important software companies in the world. Um, which is you know, just an amazing story going from football coach to uh, CEO of a spectacular, um, disastrous thing at Go just because it was too early uh, to building one of the most important software companies in the world. And it just shows a lot about Bill's character and the type of person he is. Um, and then since then, since Intuit, uh, he's become a legend in the field that I'm in, technology, uh, for, and he's known as kind of uh, the coach, again, um, in helping develop CEOs. And the CEOs, some of the CEOs he's helped develop, Steve Jobs at Apple, Eric Schmidt at Google, Jeff Bezos at Amazon, recently Dick Costolo at Twitter. Um, so these are some of the best CEOs in the world and, uh, and some of the best companies in the world. And it's in that capacity that, that I actually met Bill where he helped develop me as CEO uh, when I was CEO of Opsware. And I can tell you from that that he hates the being called coach uh, in the context of helping CEOs. Um, and so the reason I call him coach is not just to make him mad, uh, which I do like to do 
Um, but, but to explain, you know, the reason that Bill doesn't like to be called coach uh, is because, you know, for him, coaching means something. You know, it means like teaching people how to block and tackle, teaching them how to play the game, taking them through the fundamentals, the kinds of things that coaches do, which isn't quite what he does uh, in his new role. Um, but there are things that coaches do that he does do that I think are very applicable to uh, both CEOs and, and, and his work as uh, chairman of the board of trustees at Columbia. And that is Bill enables people to be their best. Uh, and you can see that in the people he works with in, in technology. And, and I see that uh, in what he does at the university. And everybody who's around Bill, everybody who knows him, they're just a little better than they are when he's not there. And he really enables that. And then people who played for him and people I've worked with him really know that. And it makes me so proud uh, to be part of it. And when I talk to people, and the other thing that great coaches do is when you, when you play for them, it's your team. It's not their team, it's your team. And when you work for them, it's not their company, it's your company. And everybody who worked at Go, Go is their company. And everybody who works you know, in the companies that Bill works for, you know, Google is their company and Twitter is their company. And at Columbia, what I've noticed since Bill has been chairman of the board of trustees is people really feel like it's their university. That it's, and I feel like Columbia is my university. And so I would just say that I'm very proud to introduce Bill Campbell and Lee Bollinger, who, uh, who make me proud that Columbia is my university. Thank you. I didn't. First thing you have to notice is, is that Ben jumped up from there and Lee and I walked around. I don't know if that was an IQ test or a statement about age. but yeah. I, I wanted to jump, but Bill said we had to walk up the <laughs> stairs. So. Those couple artificial hips don't quite work yeah. that well. <laughs> ben, thank you for your, for your introduction of, of both of us. And uh, I am... Uh, Deeply thankful for your participation as an alumnus at, uh, at our university. So we've got an opportunity to, and we'll leave some of the questions open for the audience. It, it certainly had a at, at part of the time, but I've got some topics that I'd like to probe Lee about. And I think the most important one from my standpoint has been, Lee's been, he's in his ninth year as, as uh, president of the university. And uh, the trustees unanimously supported providing him with additional five years on his term. And, uh, you know, it's a contract that at least at the, at the world that we live in today is almost unprecedented. But our view of, our trustee view of him has been that he is the leader that we want today and he's the leader that we want tomorrow. So I just wanted to ask you, you know, your thoughts about new contract, what that means about your commitment and how you see the university moving forward. Well, so let me also begin by uh, thanking all of you for coming and, and uh, Bill for doing this. And uh, it's really terrific. And we'll obviously open this up and, and uh, have lots of conversations about lots of things. I mean, for me, the uh, simple answer to Bill's question is uh, we have so many things going on right now at the university uh, that we've started over the past eight, nine years uh, that need another five years uh, to, to really complete. Not, not so much to complete, but to make them uh, a permanent sort of feature of the university uh, that it just seemed uh, right from my standpoint and, and right from um, other people's standpoint. So what that really means, I think, in a very concrete sense, is the, the new campus. Columbia has been, as we know, absolutely starved uh, for space. Uh, and there are just so many ways in which the university has um, actually suffered by not having the, the kind of space to grow and expand. And universities are places that build new knowledge. And as you build new knowledge, it takes more laboratories, it takes more classrooms, it takes more students, it takes more faculty. That's just the nature of what universities do. And if you cannot expand, you cannot become a, a truly great place. And we've got this new campus, 18 acres, 6 million square feet, 
take 50 years to build out. Um, we never would have thought we would be there 10 years ago. Uh, and now we have that. And, and we're just at this moment completing an opening next week, the last building on Morningside Heights. Northwest Corner building, inelegantly called uh, that, but it's on the Northwest Corner. <laughs> and it's for interdisciplinary science that, that completes Morningside Heights, uh, one of the great academic spaces in the world. And we are simultaneously, the trustees approved, the first building on the new campus in Manhattanville, a Mind Brain Behavior Institute. And that will open in five years, hence my desire to stay for five more years. But there are lots of other things we can talk about. So Manhattanville, you know, let's stay <coughs> on Manhattanville for a second yeah. and you know what that has meant. Your vision, you know, there were a lot of times when you would admonish me to also push the trustees to say, we can't chicken out on this, we've got to do this. And when a lot of the things occurred with the city, et cetera, some of the regulatory approvals that were required there, yeah. you know, you had you had your head down and you made sure that you did everything that it took. Is, is Manhattanville, I mean, is it, is it, does it save Columbia from, you know, that, that physical constraint that, that would, you know, that's collapsed many urban uh, uh, so universities? I think the answer is yes. I, I think it is, it is the place for new energy that will affect both Morningside Heights, Washington Heights, Lamont Doherty, uh, the offices and places we're setting up around the world. It is Manhattanville that is the uh, sort of seminal uh, uh, thing for the institution. And, and it's, you know, Harvard has Alston. Yep. And one of the things about Alston is that nobody wants to move there. <laughs> uh, and you can't get the law school to, you know, Larry Summers went over to the law school. They didn't want to move. He went elsewhere. Uh, at Columbia, there is a pent-up need for new space and uh, new facilities. And uh, so in phase one, which will go through 2015, uh, we have the Mind Brain Behavior Initiative and, and Institute. We have the School of the Arts, small building for it, larger building across the street. We have an academic conference center, which we don't have at Columbia Place to really have uh, major uh, meetings. School of International Public Affairs will have a, a building and the business school. You may have just read Henry Kravis uh, committed $100 million towards this new project. Um, and um, so the business school will move. That URIS, uh, which is you know, not the greatest building in the world, um, um, will then be available for other programs, international yeah. programs. And so it'll help that. It'll help Uptown. It is critical. So there, you know, we get a lot of criticism, you know, over the years and you know, the U.S. News and World Report, you know, the famous or infamous, you know, ranking systems about, you know, the lack of, of space in, on, uh, on campus and in, and in certainly the business school. This last year, you know, remarkably, uh, we were named number four right. in universities in U.S. News and World Report survey. I know because I was there, I watched you put together a plan that suggested that we wanted to be back in the top five. And the validation was, you know, I think, enormous. Uh, you know, the trustees were you know, uh, very enthusiastic about it. Whether we like that survey or whether we don't, at least this year, it's, it suited our need. We like it. We like right. it. <laughs> this year we like it. So right. talk about your thought process of that, of that long-term <clears throat> strategy that you put in place and how you course correct every year to ensure that, that the university's on track to achieve that top five? Well, um, I mean, first of all, let me just say it's great. It's fantastic working with Bill on these overall ambitions for the university. Just great. And, um, uh, and the trustees have been uh, just so supportive and helpful and a really well-functioning uh, board and the, that makes all the difference uh, in the world and, and uh, faculty deeply committed uh, to all of these uh, ventures. So the basic outline is um, uh, Columbia has to be known as one of the top five or six universities in the world. It just has to be a given. 
Uh, and that's essentially Harvard, Yale, Columbia. Put Princeton in, even though Princeton is uh, significantly undergraduate. I think it's Stanford. I, I believe Berkeley is, is um, underrated um, in the sort of national rankings. I think Berkeley is one of the great uh, institutions in the country. But Chicago, I mean, these are, these are the core. And Columbia's got to be there. For Columbia to, to be there, uh, it has to do a number of things. It has to solve the space problem, uh, which we have. It's been rezoned. Uh, it's ready to go. It's a, an incredible uh, uh, moment. Only happens once a century, uh, and, uh, and we're ready to, to build. Resources, and that starts with trustees, uh, and um, because trustees have to give in order for other people to give, and the trustees have done that. Uh, the $4 billion capital campaign was mentioned. That's un that was unthinkable for Columbia 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it's the largest capital campaign goal in the United States other than Stanford's at 4.25. We will finish uh, that $4 billion goal a year ahead of time, even with the recession. Uh, and uh, that's a tribute to the alums, it's a tribute to the parents and to the people who support Columbia. Uh, we will shortly uh, announce that we're going to continue the capital campaign and, uh, for another two years and, and we'll have a, a bigger announcement to, to go along with that. Another factor on the resources side. Uh, ten years ago, we were 13th in the country in actual dollars in. Uh, capital campaigns count future gifts, promises of future gifts, but the actual dollars in, we were 13th in the country in, in that. For the past five, six years, we have routinely been in the top five, and that's where we should be. Uh, we're usually third right behind Harvard, and not right behind Harvard and Stanford, but third in number right behind, but Harvard is $100 million more. We're about 400 to 500 million a year being raised. That's how supportive people are of Columbia now. Harvard's about 600 uh, million and Stanford's about 700 million. So that's really good news because that means that there's a 200 million dollar hole there that we can quickly <laughs> fill um, and, uh, and we could use it. So resources. Then you have to build the academic programs because all this only matters if you have great faculty and great students. So all this is just to make that happen. And people have been working on the undergraduate, on the college, and general set for uh, several decades, and it's, and we've worked on it, and it's paying off. And and to have uh, U.S. News rank it, uh, the university fourth among national universities is is a, a great sign of, of how far we've come. So one one of the hallmarks of, of your tenure there has been you know fiscal responsibility, and I think in the past, people have felt that the university has been frivolous and didn't operate itself well. And you know, from where I sit, and I know you have felt very strongly about the caliber of people that you brought in to, to run the university. And you know, one of the, the great turnarounds has been medical center, et cetera. So, yeah. talk a little bit about the importance of of you know, how you're managing budgets, and you know how strong you are on articulating defined uh, goals financially for uh, your team. Well, let me start with um, again with the trustees. I. When I started, a decision had already been reached to take the endowment uh, and to put it in a professional uh, management. Uh, it was the trustees and the president and the CFO will sit on the board, but up to that point, it had been a subcommittee of the trustees. You don't want, basically, you don't want trustees and the university administration running the endowment. It should be something that's separate. And that has really paid off. So in the downturn, we were down 16%, uh, whereas other places were down 30%. Uh, and uh, we came back 17% uh, in the next year. I mean, overall, uh, we're 8 9%, I think. Uh, we've done extremely well. The only, the only university that was close to us in terms of yeah. in, in endowment return and, and, and lack of losses was University of Pennsylvania. The rest of them were in the yep. low to mid-30s. Yep. You know, so and we, uh, we were, and our recovery, as of course, has been 
as Lee said, has been faster as well. And then as soon as we saw the downturn, we said we're going to plan for the worst. And I immediately cut my budget 10% and, and uh, other people cut theirs 10% and we, we uh, really took immediate action. And then because we weren't so dependent on the endowment, in part because our endowment's smaller than our competitors, but also uh, because we haven't really relied on it in the same way, and because we took quick action, we're, we're now in a period of growth. We kept the ambition while uh, the, uh, the world has made everybody struggle. More broadly, I mean, I, my view is um, uh, you try to get people who really are strong, very, very good and smart people. And, and uh, I, I prize that in the administration. And then I, I help them and I support them and I... Uh, criticize them and, and the like, and we brought in Lee Goldman from here. UCSF. Uh, yep, yeah, UCSF it may have been your doctors uh, for some of you, because he was chair of internal medicine uh, here and uh, has done just a great job of bringing financial stability to uh, to the medical school and the health sciences. And Robert Kasdan has done this in the uh, university, and um, uh, so we've really managed, I think, our resources well. So, you know, you, when you think about it, you know, you have the people on the, on the fundraising side, Fred, and, and, you know, before him, Susan, Susan Fagan, Fagan. before Fred. Susan Fagan, one of the, yeah. you know, the great, great performers in, that we've ever ha had at Columbia. Lee Goldman, Robert Kasdan, you've surrounded yourself with terrific people, and, and it's paid off. And for all of you who, who really have struggled, you know, with your businesses through this economic downturn, Columbia has done the same thing, struggled, but managed itself beautifully well under Lee's leadership. So let, let's talk a little bit more about, you know, uh, Donna mentioned CAA. And again, that was another yeah. thing that you brought to the university, you know, that there had been a small number of people that contributed large sums of money to the well-being of the university. Your view was that the Columbia Alumni Association should be one of interconnection, you know, t having people feel very close to and understanding the workings of the university and and sharing in its its uh, intellectual benefit, and you know this today is you know under Donna's leadership has turned out to be a you know phenomenal uh, organization. You know I it, you've you've obviously seen this kind of thing work before, you know the grassroots level where we're not yeah. reaching in everybody's pocket. We want to make sure that what we're looking for are people that care a lot about the university. Yep, and, and we've tried, I think, uh, the way to put it is we've tried to change the character of what it means to be a student, an alum, a parent, uh, a supporter, a part of the community, faculty of Columbia. We tried to change that character. So I think we all know everybody in this room who has been part of Columbia for many decades, as has been true for me and Bill, and, and I can see many here, you all, everybody knows that Columbia had a reputation for not being an easy place to go to school. And it didn't stay in touch with you afterwards, and it didn't, um, you know, it, it was not that kind of uh, warm, uh, really friendly, connected kind of institution. And there are a variety of justifications for it. Uh, New York City, it's tough. You got to come and you know you got to make it. Uh, uh, losing in sports is actually a positive, um, <laughs> and um, and you know that doesn't matter. School spirit. I have been successful then. <laughs> and school spirits, uh, you know, something that's almost um, uh, anti-intellectual. You know, I mean, it's a, and um, so. All that's wrong. I mean, all that's completely, completely wrong. And, and so it was, and, and because the university had struggled so much in the 19, coming out of the, the events of 1968-69, how, whatever you think about what happened then, the fact of the, and I was there in 1968, the fact of the matter is no university was hurt more by what happened in 1968-69 then Columbia. Uh, and that's 4,000 police coming in the middle of the night and, and it, it just was a really traumatizing event. And that was followed by the 
utter decline of New York City in the 1970s, and Columbia was a tough place to be, just like New York City was a tough place to be. So by 1980, when Mike Sovereign became president, he had to start rebuilding an institution, not from scratch, but it was tough. Well, my view was we've got to make this a, a feeling of a community. And one of the things that was true is that there was no university-wide alumni. So every school had its own alumni. And you couldn't identify. If you wanted to be part of the university, and many of us do, uh, there was no place to connect. And so we created the CAA, and that's been a stunning success. And you've led this bill and gotten trustees involved to, to take it on and, and been supportive of this. And then the athletics program, let's, let's talk about that. Um, because I felt that you know, it was inexcusable to have a program where young people would come in and the expectation would be that they would lose. Um, <laughs> and lose again and again. I mean, and it just, that was unacceptable. And, and so you, you had to, to change the culture in that. And so we got a new athletic director, we began to hire new coaches, supportive, and, and you know, Bill has been the person I would credit most uh, with, uh, try, with bringing the spirit that Bill has uh, to, to this, among many other things that, that he's done. But the, we're now, in terms of uh, Ivy Championships uh, every year in the middle of the Ivy Pack. And, and, um, and uh, you know, that's, that's good. And we've got it a, is. A, I mean, we've won, we've won more Ivy titles in the last three years than we did the previous 35. <laughs> and Diane Murphy is our athletics director. She has been terrific. And we are growing all of our sports. We're getting better and better tremendously, and, better. and the women's sports programs have been outstanding. Yeah. So our, you know, we are, f football was four and six this year. Men's basketball program is off to a good start. But it could have been six and four very easily, right? Could have been, just yeah. lost a few. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. It's absolutely See, true. We got our president paying attention to all this. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, the morale on campus and you know there's a lot of people in here from college undergraduate college engineering etc you know how do you how do you see university uh, supporting I you know historically and I think you know Dave Marquardt's down here you know those of us who who were there always felt that the undergraduate got short trip to the professional schools and and you know, I haven't heard that complaint, no. and I've been at a trustee now eight years, and I haven't heard that complaint in, in seven. Right. Because you support the undergraduate. Tell me the importance. Tell us all about the importance of undergraduate education and what you've done to make sure that it has its own, you know, s strong feeling. Well, I, I think um, the way I try to put it is that uh, it's, like, it's like a parent. And I know we don't like to think about college students and, and sort of a parent relation, child relationship with the university. But, but I, I think that there is a, a, uh, an element uh, of that. We are responsible for the education and the well-being of these very young people uh, who come into our community. And you know, it's a privilege, in fact, because these will be people who will go on to have major positions uh, in the world and influence the world. And to be with them in this formative period is a great privilege, but still, it's our responsibility as well. And the response, you're, you're only as good as how good you are to the youngest people among you. Uh, if you neglect the youngest people in your community, you, you will not be a great university just because you will not be a great person. And so I think it's critical. And um, and then there are things, I mean, I teach undergraduate. Every year I teach a course on um, uh, First Amendment. I do it with undergraduates. I do it uh, in part to symbolize the importance of, of teaching undergraduates. But I think we, we know the elements of the great success. We know that the core curriculum is something that is unmatched anyplace else. And if you think I, I say it this way, I'm, nobody in this room, I predict, will go home tonight 
and say, boy, am I tired. I think I'm going to get out Aristotle's ethics. <laughs> <laughs> and read one of, the, uh, one of the chapters to relax. The, the, the fact of the matter is, at age 18 and 19, you're sitting in a small class with a gifted faculty member and reading Aristotle's ethics or Montaigne's essays or Shakespeare play. And you would never, you won't do that. To have that experience once in your life, especially at that formative moment, is a truly life-changing experience, so, or life, just memorable. Then you have, I think, fantastic uh, faculty who are very committed at Columbia. The, Columbia has a, you know, it's a research university, so people think there can't be that much uh, attention to undergraduate. There really is. And then you're in New York City, and then there's the fact that Columbia, I think, is the most naturally global institution of any university in the country, and for a young person in this world to be able to uh, be on a campus where you can hear people who are working in Africa and villages and uh, po extreme poverty or working on AIDS or, or Sarkozy's in to give a speech or uh, you, know, you could work on a project in Jordan because we have a new center there or you can go to debate. I mean, this is a, this is a, a, a opportunity for a young person that's really unmatched. And the proof is you ask any undergraduate or you ask any parent of an undergraduate, any student, but I'm focusing now on undergraduates, and they will say, I'm incredibly happy. Right. So talk a little bit, just very quickly, about, you know, you put a new dean in charge in, in, in our engineering school. In, uh, and, uh, you know, they, the acclamation of him as a, as, a, as a leader, he's inspired a lot of people to, to be excited about engineering on our campus again. So this is uh, Fanny Oscar Penimora. Uh, who was originally from the Dominican Republic and spoke no English until at age 21 or something he came to the United States with his mother, I believe, and took a course in English at Riverside Church, I believe, is that right? And, um, and uh, top, I, you know, it's, and then went to MIT and then went uh, on to um, uh, uh, a very fine career uh, as an engineer, as a faculty member. And he's come in, he's very young and dynamic, and, and uh, has uh, taken on how to make this very small, but wonderful, with lots of potential, uh, engineering school and applied science and, and really advance it. And we've settled on certain areas to emphasize. Biomedical is right. clearly one we should uh, be great, truly great in. Uh, nanoscience, another very uh, hot and for good reason uh, area, and, and several others, computer science. And he's very hard at work at this. He's got a program of raising money for rising star faculty, and within the space of a year, he, he yeah, raised put, the multiple chairs. Took a, you know, they've leased a couple of buildings and put some entrepreneurial startup opportunities yeah. there. And yeah, <laughs> pretty funny. And so for those of us who you know, from Silicon, Silicon Valley, He's, he's had a big reach out here, and a lot of people that have, that are in this room tonight that are that uh, have uh, engineering backgrounds from Columbia have really been very very helpful in going back there and teaching some classes and and being involved in the program. So that's been positive. Let's talk a little mm -hmm. bit about the professional schools. You know, the, mm -hmm. obviously the you know the big three that mm -hmm. you know you you mentioned Lee Goldman in in, in medicine, and then you've got uh, law. And business as well. Just talk about you know those. Uh, we, I know we have a lot of graduates in, in here from from those three, and and with this number four ranking, you know, each of those has moved up, I think, considerably in, in yeah. the, the way they're viewed uh, nationally. Well, they're they're great and um, really great schools, obviously. And we've got fantastic small schools, uh, but uh, the journalism school under Nick Lemon and. Um, architecture school, public health. I mean, these are all fantastic places. Uh, business school, first of all, I, I think um, Manhattanville is 
very, very important and exciting opportunity for the business school. And to have Henry and the Board of Overseers of the Business School commit themselves to, to that project uh, is, a, is a great moment. My own personal view is that business schools should be more central to the intellectual life of universities. And the reason I think that is because I, I believe, like lots of people believe, uh, that globalization sort of defines the problems of our era the interconnectedness that comes from economic activity around the, the globe, uh, and the interdependency that that's created. And, and the big project for this century, in a way, is creating the institutions that are needed to make that function in the best possible ways. We're trying to do it with Basel III, with financial regulation. We're trying to do it with climate change. We're trying to do it with international terrorism. We're trying to do it with uh, economic uh, regulation. I mean, this is this is the big big project, and it happens to really go Columbia's way because we're in New York City and because we're naturally international. Well, the business school should be the place in the university that leads this discussion, and so I'm I'm very very uh, uh, keen on the business school taking on greater leadership. Glenn Hubbard is the, the dean of the school and doing a fine job and very much wants to move in this way and very prominent, of course, is a, a participant in these debates. Law school, I think, also, um, uh, of course, great, great institution, uh, but I think it's in a, in a very interesting stage of kind of reshaping uh, its intellectual uh, agenda generally. Uh, I often say uh, I am a product of my time, which is the, the 1960s and 70s when I began law teaching. Uh, and that era was defined, I think, by American constitutional law. Every single major problem we had in this country was refracted through constitutional law in some kind of way. And people like me uh, sprouted up and, and uh, taught things like the First Amendment, uh, became highly specialized. And now it's still important to have constitutional law experts, but it's even more important to have international trade law experts and energy law experts and how do you build legal institutions for this uh, uh, interdependent uh, economic system. Uh, and the law school is, is really uh, working in, in those kinds of directions. I think it's very promising. So talk a little bit more about uh, you have put you know, after about your third year there, you took a, you know, big initiative on globalization. In many cases, you know, kind of even scared the faculty a little bit in terms of your, your views about, you know, how important the globalization effort should be. And gradually, not only won them over, but have them, you know, really participating actively in what we're doing. Just talk about that a little bit, your view of the importance of what you've done uh, in, in our regional centers. So building off what uh, I just said, I, my general view is that uh, universities have a very, very significant scholarly responsibility and educational responsibility to address these issues uh, that arise from this phenomenal increase in uh, economic interdependency. As Bill knows, I sit, um, <clears throat> sit on the New York Fed board, uh, Federal Reserve Bank board, and, and uh, will become chair in, uh, of the board in January. So I, I've had, I've been on the board now for four years, so I've had a kind of uh, certain perspective, certain window onto the global uh, financial world. Um, and more broadly, I, I find it of interest uh, when you think about the American economy and where it's going to go once we get out of this um, uh, particular uh, severe downturn. What many people are counting on is the Chinese consumer uh, and the Indian consumer and the Brazilian consumer. Now, that's a stunning thing to say. Um, if that's so, and a lot of people are saying this, uh, and it sounds right, uh, how do we create the world that makes that work? 
uh, in many of these countries, there is no rule of law. No rule of law. Uh, we haven't really operated in an, in an economy, in an economic system, without a rule of law for quite a long time. Uh, what do we think about food safety? What do we think about product safety? What do we think about environmental issues? How are we going to grapple with these things? This is a fantastic opportunity for Colombia because we're really good at this and we can be really great at it. We've got Lamont Doherty, which has done some of the finest work uh, in the study of oceans and climate change and glaciers. We've got the Earth Institute with Jeff Sachs. We've got Joe Stiglitz. We've got uh, on and on. And, and this is something we can really build on. Then you say, well, how do you do this? Because how, uh, we've got those great people but, and, and some great institutions, but how do we more broadly do this? So just to be very quick about it, there are three possible strategies. One is, you can just do more of what you already do. Send more students on study abroad programs, have more faculty come in from around the world, et cetera. Just do more of it. That's one. A second is to set up branch campuses around the world. And NYU is now famously setting up one in Abu Dhabi. Uh, but in Qatar, there are already a number of universities, Carnegie Mellon, Northwestern, Texas A&M, Cornell Medical School, who have set up branch campuses in Qatar. And we have chosen not to do that. Um, and there are a number of reasons for it, but basically the reason is that you can only go where there's a lot of money. Uh, because whatever we do, we lose money. And it's just too expensive to give the kind of education we give, and therefore you've got to get supplemental money, and the only places that have it are, are places like the Emirates. The third is to set up what we're calling centers are basically offices and some facilities that are made available with very sophisticated people running them, very connected. And they are going to be interconnected. We've got them now in four or five places in Mumbai and Mon Jordan, Beijing, We're just opening one in Nairobi, um, uh, and in Paris, of course. And, and these will provide a network of uh, support offices for faculty and students to work around the world. And there'll be research projects and conferences and meetings and so on. And that's a short version of, of what we've decided to do. And it's very, I think, very quite, it's quite exciting. <clears throat> yeah, I might add that, you know, I think you're pushing uh, all of the deans to incorporate mm -hmm. uh, globalization courses that, that really would stress yes. uh, international in the curriculum in almost in every school in, in the university. It is, it's been remarkable to see. Um, I have, <clears throat> I'm going to give you one opportunity. I hope you, hope you seize on this opportunity now. I want to make sure that I yesterday George that W. Way. was at, um, he went, went to Facebook and promoted his book. Well, you have a rather large audience here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your, oh, that's really your new sweet book you. and you have an opportunity now <clears throat> yeah, to, see, yeah, if, yeah. to uh, see if you can't sell some. I, I think I think we're giving it away. I don't even think they. <laughs> well, maybe see if they buy it first. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I teach First Amendment, uh, and that's been my field, and freedom of speech, freedom of the press. My father, my family worked in newspapers. My grandmother did. My father did. Owned a little newspaper. I grew up in Santa Rosa, just north of here, and then. When I was uh, about um, 12, we moved to Baker, Oregon. My father got this newspaper. So, and I was the janitor. I was, I've lived around newspapers and, and cared about this, these issues. The 20th century was when we created freedom of speech and press that we know today. That's the very first case in the Supreme Court of the United States interpreting the First Amendment. It wasn't until 1919. Uh, all before that, it was kind of there, but, but we really didn't have what we think of today as freedom of speech and press as a constitutional doctrine or the public policies like broadcast regulation and the like. WikiLeaks publishes this stuff. Uh, New York Times publishes it, The Guardian and so on. Uh, this is Pentagon Papers. This is, that's the case 
that's relevant. I know that case inside and out. Uh, teach it every year. This is my world. New York Times versus Sullivan and so on. It's an elaborate, really complicated, wonderfully successful 20th century invention that we have in this country of freedom of speech and press. Neo-Nazis can march in Skokie. Uh, Washington Post can publish uh, classified documents. You, public officials can't sue you if you make a false statement about them that hurts their reputation. We got all these rules and principles and doctrines and, and so on. Suddenly, and literally suddenly, we're in a world where now the issues are global and the communication system is global because people like you and others here and, and others have created this instantaneous global communication system. And what that means is that you now say something here, you've now said something, you've said something around the world. That means you may be prosecuted, not here because you've got First Amendment rights, but you may be prosecuted in Turkey for offending Turkishness, which is a, a crime, or sued for libel in Britain because they got m very different uh, approach to libel than New York Times versus Sullivan. Or you may be in trouble in, in China, or in Singapore you may be uh, criminally prosecuted. This is a new world with a whole new set of challenges of how do we develop free speech, free press principles on a global scale. There's no, it's not as if there's nothing there. Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and coming out of World War II in the UN is a wonderful statement of global principles, but it's not been strengthened. Uh, there are regional uh, 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 institutions. But we need to pay more attention to this, just like we need to pay more attention to economic uh, institutions. And then there's the issue of how do we get the kind of information we need and that the world needs, not just how do we get the free speech, free press principles, but how do we get the information? Well, one of the things we know is that the wonderful things you've created here in Silicon Valley and elsewhere have expanded the potential of people to communicate, but they've had a devastating effect on our great institutions of the press to be able to uh, keep their business model going. So foreign correspondents are a dying breed. Foreign bureaus are a dying breed. And, uh, and you can buy Newsweek for a dollar. Uh, I mean, that's incredible. Uh, and and uh, you could have the Boston Globe for, uh, for probably the same amount. Um, and that means we're getting less international news. And what does that mean for us in this new world? Meanwhile, Al Jazeera is funded by the Qatari government and is expanding like crazy. Uh, and has a, a reach of, uh, I don't know, 75 million. And a recent study found that because the Miami Herald no longer publishes anything, I mean, they no longer have any foreign bureaus in South America, and bureaus in South America are basically um, uh, been closed by U.S. media. Al Jazeera has been opening them like crazy in South America. And if you're sitting in Washington, D.C. and want to find out something about South America, uh, a study showed that that most people turn to Al Jazeera now. Uh, well, you know, what do we do about What do we think about this? Um, France 24, Russia Today, I mean, it's a really interesting set of problems, and, and that's what I've begun to try to address. Where is Manhattan Bill? <laughs> <laughs> uh, third market? Never mind. <laughs> I was, that's what I was going to say. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> Um, sorry, Manhattanville goes from 125th Street, Broadway and 125th Street, to 133rd Street, over to the West Side Highway, which is 12th Avenue, which is right on the river. 18 contiguous acres, all rezoned now, and we own all the property. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's a little up the road, a little down the road. When, when I was a, an undergraduate uh, at Columbia College in, in the mid-50s, nobody but nobody had ever heard of Manhattanville, 
had ever even walked over to Manhattanville, except for a few of us uh, who went to a Chinese restaurant on 123rd Street. Um, I'm curious what you've done, for example, with the Borden's factory, uh, what the old Borden's milk company uh, factory over there building, which was the largest building in what is now called Manhattanville. Jeez, that's an unbelievable question. <laughs> um, uh, well, I'll tell you what we've done with it. Um, if, if we're talking about the same one, it's the, it's the white tile building on the south side of 125th Street. That's, that's it. Right? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I mean, just to show you how the world changed, um, we have a, a, a tower a apartment house that's right there on 125th Street, right at the corner, just down from that uh, milk factory. In the 1970s, that became so dangerous, that area, that the entrance on 125th Street was closed and reopened on that little street that goes up the hill by the viaduct. We are now reopening that entrance where a lot of faculty live and graduate students, opening that on 125th Street. Uh, that building you mentioned is preserved. We're going to keep it. Uh, we are renovating it. The School of the Arts is using it and will continue to use it. And that will anchor the south part of the campus. It's a lovely little building in white because they wanted a symbol that was used to pasteurize milk. Mm -hmm. And they wanted a symbol of purity and uh, so on. And, it's, uh, and Renzo Piano, who's the master uh, planner for Manhattanville, whom we hired, and will design the first uh, uh, three or four buildings on the south side, declared that the little grandmother uh, of Manhattanville. And then the Studebaker building, which is just is a much bigger building and is about 134th and in the midst of all this, and we agreed to preserve that, uh, he called the grandfather. And, um, and they sort of preside over, over Manhattanville. But, you know, what sh just taking those two buildings shows why this was a great move for us, for the community, and for the city, and for the country. They don't make pasteurized milk in the Borden building anymore. Believe it or not, they were not making Studebakers in the Studebaker building either. And there's another building on the corner which we now own also at 133rd and Broadway on the east side called the Nash building. And they don't make Nashes there either. This was a thriving industrial, little small industrial area in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and by the 60s, 70s, it was on decline. And by one of the reasons we selected this area as the place for Columbia to expand uh, was because there were only 200, 150 or 200 people who lived in those 18 acres. And we promised them at the beginning that they would have better lives than, than they had then and that we would never use eminent domain against residents. Uh, and we made huge commitments to the surrounding communities and to Harlem and to the city to make this campus something that will really integrate uh, the surrounding communities. Hi, my name is Matt Morellis. I'm a, a 2008 graduate of the School of General Studies. Um, and uh, now I'm a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Um, but one of the things I noticed, you know, just in 2008 when I was graduating, is uh, the School of General Studies, which, which has a unique history in Columbia. Um, a lot of my classmates were graduating with insane debt loads. The average graduating debt load, which is truly mind-blowing, was $90,000 of debt right. for a bachelor's from Columbia. Um, and myself, I was fortunate enough to be able to work two jobs. Uh, to pay my way through school and also get scholarships and journalism awards. Um, but had I not had this op these opportunities, I would have been in the ninety to $100,000 debt range. And I was wondering what you guys are doing to lower, that, to, to lower that number, which as an alumni just seems insane. And I see my friends now, you know, these huge debt loads. And this is student loan debt. Like, you can't that's, you, can't, uh, you, can't, you can't get rid of it. It's not like a car or a house. Well, I, I uh, understand. <laughs> you, I, 
I, I don't want to make light of this, I, I, but I do want to give a, I want to give a very quick and as comprehensive as I can answer to the question and as honest. Uh, so here goes. Point number one, always remember that the education at full price that Columbia offers basically costs twice as much to deliver as the full tuition costs. I mean, that's, that's just a fact. The reason Columbia can give small classes and the core curriculum and, and all these classes, I have a, a law school and a business, is because people have given funds to this endowment and continue to give, and there are other, some other, in the sciences, it's because of, of public funding. But at the end of the day, it costs twice as much to give the education as the full price. So always bear that in mind. Nevertheless, it's very expensive. And for people um, you know, who, who come from modest means or, or not very much means at all and families, this is, a, this is a huge issue. And it's a huge issue because we are a public institution. We're not public in the sense of University of California, Berkeley, or the University of Michigan, but we're public in just the same way in that we, we're not out there to make a profit and we have a public trust to perform. And part of that public trust is to make sure that we do as much as we can for the American ideal, which is that a young person's education should not depend upon the wealth of their family. I mean, that's, if American lives by certain values, or it has certain values, that's one of its, its top ones because we, you know, otherwise we've, we've got an aristocracy and a plutocracy. Well, third point, Columbia College comes about as close to reaching the ideal as any place in the United States, probably in the world. If your family makes less than $60,000, you come free to Columbia now. We've increased the financial aid. We, loans for families making $120,000. Um, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, grant. We only give grants, not loans. Um, so the financial aid picture, and we put a huge amount of resources because we don't have enough endowment to, to match our commitments in the, in the college, but we have substantial endowments to build on and we have substantial opportunities for uh, raising funds for the college. If you go to the professional schools, the problem is different. The problem is not uh, how do you pay for it getting it. It's the problem of life choices. So a law school, we charge $40,000 a year to, to go to law school. You can't afford that if you're going to go work at Cravath, Swain & Moore uh, or uh, another major law firm. That, that is not a big uh, problem in, in life. But if you want to go do public interest law, that's a big problem because you're not going to be able to, to pay that back. So that's our problem there. And we have very good, but not as good as we want, loan forgiveness programs. Then we go to general studies. So we don't have nearly the same kind of financial aid for general studies that we do for the college. And the general studies is 1,000 students who are very, very important to Columbia and valuable to the, to the country. Not all people develop at age 17 into the gifted people we admit of the thousands of people who apply to Columbia College. Some people struggle in life and then uh, become brilliant at age 30. Some people go off and become dancers and some people do this and that and we provide a program to capture uh, to give opportunities to people like that. A lot of veterans, uh, I mean, one of, we're very proud of the um, number of veterans. I think we have 200, 300 uh, uh, veterans in the undergraduate program at Columbia. So how does that happen? Well, universities are built on, uh, have been built on historical autonom or an autonomy for individual schools and, and departments. And on part of that autonomy is that they can keep what they raise. And the college 
raises, has raised a lot more over time than general studies. And the law school has raised a lot more over time than the journalism school. And the business school has raised a lot more and has much more access to, to wealth than the School of the Arts. And so there is within universities a serious differential in the ability to support uh, people to come in and not to graduate with, with major burdens. We all know we inherit institutions that are complex and, and something as large and, and as uh, complicated as a university. You don't just come in and say, well, we're going to change all that. And the college has to give $100 million of its endowment to general studies. I mean, that's just not the way uh, these institutions work. But what we've tried to do is to put money, our own resources, into general studies. And we've done that, uh, I think, significantly. And we've made very special efforts to try to raise financial aid on part of general studies. Peter on has been terrific uh, in, in doing this, and, but we're not, we're not close uh, to where we should be. Let's take a couple more questions. Uh, yeah, Mr. Bollinger? I'm sorry, was it? Where are you? Right here, right here. Yeah. Ted Summy, uh, Engineering 06. Um, you spoke on two themes, uh, the recession and globalization. Um, with those Chinese, Indians, and Brazilians in the developing world coming online in the years to come, and recession uh, with an unemployment rate of about 10%. How do you feel education responds in the United States, um, more specifically Columbia, and liberal arts education to a more competitive job environment to prepare Columbia graduates in that environment? Well, that's a big question and an important one. I, I would, of course, my view, I bet, is the same view of everybody in this room. There's no better way to prepare for uh, a lifetime of employment than to do a liberal arts uh, education, by which we mean non-specialized. Uh, uh, but I think that there are things that we have to do uh, to uh, help young people become even more prepared. And, uh, and so what would those be? One, I think we've uh, segmented our knowledge too much. I use the law as an example. I think it's great that we have law schools, fantastic, I love them, uh, but uh, law should be taught more to undergraduates. Uh, and uh, there's no reason why uh, law should be a subject that should be viewed as professional uh, and the like. And so I enjoy teaching First Amendment I, to undergraduate. I do it exactly the way I do in a law school. Um, I think uh, so. I think there's room for the business school to teach undergraduates, and in fact, they've got a program uh, doing. And this is not to be professional about it, but I think public health. We're getting trying to get more into the undergraduate uh, education. I think the uh, other thing I would say is that we really need to help our students uh, experience the world. We are not. We are in a time when actually going to Beijing or going to Mumbai or going to um, uh, a small village in, in um, Kenya uh, is, is critical to a young person's sense of potential learning. I mean, we all know this very odd experience where you travel someplace, you've never been there before, and suddenly you start reading every article in the paper about this place and you, you learn about it. There's something that, that triggers in your mind the little experience you've had that makes it a fantastic learning experience for, for life. And you feel connected to it. Uh, we need to have lots of opportunities for our students to get out there and just to see what's going on uh, in the world and then build that into their education. And I think all those things will um, will be important. I think also bringing more people from around the world to campus. I happen to believe that um, uh, we will be in a internationally competitive world within 10 years for undergraduate education. So my view is we don't care whether, we just want the most brilliant young mathematician. And we don't care whether the person comes from Pakistan or Belarus or, or um, 
and, and there'll be more of that kind of, of competition. And right now, I think we're at 9 or 10% under uh, international students at the, um, at the uh, college. I'll bet we'll be at 15% in 10 years and, and, um, and more. So let's take one more question, and uh, I'm getting a hook here. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, we'll take both. Go ahead. You, you start, and you finish. Well, I think Barack Obama is, um, you know, there's, there's kind of nothing better than having a president of the United States, a graduate of your institution. <laughs> um, so, um, so I, I, you know, I, I think it makes us all feel uh, really good, and that's great. And and um, <laughs> um, and I'm not. I, I mean, it'd be easy to say I, I think he is who he is because he. Um, he studied at Columbia and, and maybe took some of the core curriculum. He came late. I, I think that would be, um, uh, you know, kind of phony. Uh, I, I think, I, I think he is, um, you know, obviously an extraordinary individual. And the fact that he is uh, part of our community uh, is uh, makes us all feel uh, a little more extraordinary. But that's true. Um, I mean, that, that's a legitimate thing that happens. Um, so if you're at Cambridge, um, you know that Newton went to Cambridge and, and, uh, and Milton was there and so on. And, and that's how you build great institutions. You get a little piece of that in your head and you're a young person, again, 17, 18 years old. That's something you, that's where I see the value of that. Um, Warren Buffett, uh, um, again, uh, I think quite an extraordinary individual. I, I've gotten to know him. I serve on the board of the Washington Post Company, as does uh, Warren. And um, I, I think really a, a remarkable uh, individual. And he comes back to Columbia and, and gives these um, uh, wonderful um, speeches, where he meets with students. And, and uh, so it's a, it's a, great, uh, a great link. You have the last one. I better make it good then. Uh, Jeremy <laughs> Newman, uh, SIPA. Uh, I was just wondering with the, the themes you talked about tonight, if you could uh, kind of see where you see SIPA sitting with that in the future. So we've really, I mean, when you talk about globalization, the first thing we, we think of is, is, the first thing I think of is SIPA. That's our kind of flagship, uh, our flag into globalization. And uh, John Coatsworth, who's a very distinguished uh, historian of Latin America, um, has been serving as dean, doing a great job, and will continue to uh, serve. And we've designated one of the beginning five buildings in phase one of Manhattanville for the School of International Public Affairs, because right now it is stuck in that 1960s, 70s um, um, Soviet-style um, um, building right by the, the law school, and, and that's, that's tough. Um, so so it's, on a, it's on a growth, and a, we're very supportive of, of SIPA. And they have some great, great programs. And I would say, you know, the journalism school and social work and public health, I could go on about every single one of them uh, as just how how dynamic they, they really are. You, everybody, all of us should feel very, very proud uh, to have the connections we do to this institution. It's, it's a stunning, stunning place. So thank you, Lee, thank for you. You know, wonderful, wonderful um, uh, uh, responses to interview questions and your engagement so totally with this group and, and what you've done for the university. We're proud to have signed you up for <laughs> for five more years and and uh, just your accomplishments over these last uh, nine have been remarkable. We've got a lot more to do and we're really proud. Thank you.
Thank you, Lee, and thank you, Bill. I'd, thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Lee and Bill. I invite you to the reception, and I invite you to the private viewing of the anniversary show in the Haas Atrium. The anniversary show, 75 Years of Looking Forward, is curated by Janet Bishop, a graduate of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Columbia. It illustrates the story of the artists, collectors, cultural mavericks, and San Francisco leaders who founded, built, and have animated the museums. Enjoy the rest of the evening, and thanks for coming.